Thank you all for coming. We're here to celebrate a decade of the magazine Mother, which is an online radical zine exploring parenthood from all angles with a focus on women and non-binary and trans folks having kids. And we publish prose, poetry, essays, interviews, and notably comics. And we published comics since the beginning of the magazine. The magazine launched in 2013 online. It was founded by Michelle T, who's a radical queer poet and writer. And I joined with Michelle from the beginning as we were preparing to launch as the comics editor. And then actually about six months after the magazine um, ran, started running in 2013, August 2013, Michelle had her baby that she was trying for for a long time and in a very magical way had started the magazine while she was still trying to conceive. And I love that about the magazine, that it was um, idealistic in that way from the beginning, radical in that way in thinking about how we make family and how we become ourselves as parents. And throughout the life of the magazine, we've also um, included people who are trying to conceive and who don't, people who are purposely deciding not to have children who are child-free or childless. And we've also included quite a bit on choice and parents for choice and supporting choice. So I just want to put that up front since the folks on this panel are actually coming from the perspective of having living children um, as well as having had the experience of loss that we've also published folks who have not gotten to that place. And so it's very open and welcome to all of that. But to put a cap on what I was saying, Michelle actually had her baby six months later and handed over the keys to me and I've been running the magazine for 10 years now. <laughs> Uh, so that's been a fabulous experience, and I am so delighted to celebrate it at SPX, where I came early on and found and met some of the cartoonists who then populated the pages of it. And we have five of them here today who are all also here to celebrate where their work has gone in the last 10 years. So how they started creating comics about this experience and the places they've been able to place their work as well as within the community of Mother Magazine. So with that introduction, I want to say hello to Leela Corman, Summer Pierre, Glynis Fox, Whit Taylor, and Pam Y. <laughs> this is a little um, image that, uh, that Kyla Roberts made for me. <laughs> so Leela. I'm going to just very briefly introduce Leela and then ask her to start talking a little bit about her work. So each of you are going to do that for about two to three minutes, and then we'll get into conversation. So Leela is a painter, educator, graphic novel creator. She works especially in the diaspora of Ashkenazi culture and third generation restorative work. Her books include Unterzaken, which by the way just won the MOCA Festival Award some 10 years after it was first published. So strange. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> also a lot of other awards. And uh, you are not a guest with Field Mouse Press, which is new at the show. We all wish for Deadly Force. And she has a forthcoming, long planned and uh, created book, Victory Parade, about World War II, women's wrestling, and the astral plane, which we published by Pantheon in 2024. So here is some of Leela's work from the magazine. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this. And I want to mention this was actually reprinted at Mother, which is something we've been open to from the beginning. It's an all-volunteer magazine. And while we do publish and create and develop original work, it's been very important to me to showcase key creators uh, in this space who may have had it published elsewhere. Uh, hi. Thank you for that great introduction. I want to specify uh, the astral plane over Buchenwald. Ah, um, thank you. Sorry. Specifically in this next <laughs> book. And Brooklyn. Um, so do you want me to talk about this piece in particular? Or in your or work in general. Generally? If you want to introduce this piece, this is the most recent thing we've had up at Mother Magazine. It was also included in a gallery exhibit we had in Seattle. So this piece was kind of an improvisation, which is not something I do very often anymore, although it is where I started from in comics. Uh, and it's funny to look at that now because I, I'm in such a different place. <laughs> um, but I was, I was in the rage part of grief when I did that, and that is where that is coming from. Um, but my work in general uh, has really changed since I started 
uh, since you guys started, and I think I published something with you very early on. Yes, also. Lily was one of our first pieces. And my work is completely different now. Um, it really took off when I started using watercolor mm -hmm. again, because I had originally trained as a painter. And so when I, when I brought that back into my comics, it was kind of like a <laughs> explosive seismic change in my work. I'm just gonna show a few more panels. So we have this piece up at the magazine. It's a piece about grief. And the first piece you had actually was also about grief at Mother. It was um, the wailing. Oh yeah, it, well it was the, um, it was, I was kind of riffing on something I saw in my travels years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, it's just, I think actually you guys were the first magazine that I did any work for that felt even possible mm -hmm. after my first child died. I spent a year not being able to draw at all, which is like completely, I, I remember thinking, like, this is meaningless. Why am, I, why am I illustrating anything? Like, who cares about this? So Mother was the first place that I did something for that I felt like, OK, I, can, I feel sort of anchored here. I can, actually, I can actually do this. And so it was my re-entry, in a lot of ways, back into comics. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think I will mention about the magazine that we have a top line category for loss. I think that as soon as you start the experience of trying to create a family, it's very quickly that people understand how much loss is a, a real and shared experience within the community of parents. Mm -hmm. And your work has been very meaningful. We also have a long piece with your husband about his book, about your daughter. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, that that was included too. That book is amazing. Tom is one of the only cisgender dad dudes we have in the magazine. <laughs> I'll tell him that he's gonna be really happy <laughs> to hear like that. There's like three. It's like Tom, <laughs> Tomas Maniz, who does Rad Dad. Um, I just had to turn someone down, being like, I know you see these guys, but we're not taking your stuff. You know, I mean, you, you, really, you really have to, you have to be really vetted. I, I, I mean that. <laughs> I'm going to show some of Glynis' work. So Glynis, let me introduce you briefly. Thanks, everybody, for you know, sticking with us mamas here. Um, Glynis is a faculty member of the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont. She has a lot of titles. Her eclectic titles include Ale Ego, Charlotte Bronte Before Jane Eyre, and Persephone's Garden, which I saw that they're selling uh, here at the booth that is with Secret Acres. Yeah. And the forthcoming 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed for Princeton University Press, which you're drawing an adaptation of that work. Um, her drawings about her kids were published regularly on Mother for years. She was one of our early original cartoonists who had an ongoing series of work. They were nominated for an Ignatz Award, and now she's been doing stuff with the New Yorker, very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to show some of um, your mother comics. So these are some bunny comics. Bunny came up a lot. Do you want to talk about what inspired you to do this work and what, how, you know, in, in some ways how it um, interacted with your parenting? Because I feel like these are like these are snapshot comics. Yeah, they are. I think um, I think that. Knowing that mother was there and that there was a place for these made me really want to put some structure to the observations of mm. daily life. And so I think that's what I feel like I, um, mother ha has given me, you know, like the, the incentive to take moments that you remember and often let go and forget and to write them down in a structured way. And, and so taking that from like journal entries to, to putting them into four panels. I drew a, a grid that I put in my notebook and then uh, every day I would draw a few of them and some of them just go nowhere, but it helped to find a rhythm to uh, observations that occurred in daily life. And, um, and now I'm, uh, as of Persephone's Garden, I'm not allowed to draw about the kids anymore. So uh, <laughs> like Leela, my work has changed a lot since the, then. And, the, and um, it's, a, it's a loss or a change in life to go from where this was the, kind of the main drive of what I did to you know, completely other things, I, um, to turn the ship slowly. And you're not allowed because they won't let you the children. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, 
they, they told me specifically, stop drawing us. And also because they grew up and they, you know, if, if you put stuff on the internet, all their pals can see and their like friends at school would say, I saw that funny comic your mom drew about you, ha ha. And, the, and Helen is like, I look like such a brat. <laughs> um, and um, you know, that, that quote from Anne Lamott about, well, you shouldn't have acted that way then. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> work for an 11 year old. <laughs> so uh, fair enough. They, that's their, their lives, but it really helped me with structuring my thoughts and not feeling so isolated or feeling like, you know, isn't, and I, I went from, you know, not wanting this to be, um, here's a really cute thing my kid said, all uh, like um, family circus mm -hmm. to, to uh, I don't know, connecting something that is more uh, connecting something about humanity or relationships or, or um, uh, what it's like to live with these characters. I just click through some more. I feel like that was something you and I worked on a lot actually in the selection of the work. Linus would mm. send me a lot of pages and we'd pick some that made a kind of narrative or hit into a larger philosophical moment, as well as we're observational, yeah. like sort of sweet work. I wanted to connect observational with philosophical. Right. <laughs> and I, I want to say that one thing that really has been meaningful, me, meaningful to me about this work is that I feel that motherhood is an intellectual role, that we can observe and have thoughts that are real and intellectual and should be given serious consideration and respect. Mm. And that the magazine is partly about forwarding that and putting that forward with critics specifically. So forwarding it yes. for us as a community and also like pushing back on other kinds of ideas of mommy bloggers right. or motherhood as consumerism or just as a as a model, like at, like uh, images of the mother as the is what is the product rather than our thoughts. So with that I want to move on to wit. Whoops, oh sorry, actually to summer. Summer <laughs> Summer is a cartoonist living in the Hudson Valley of New York. She's the author of the Eisner-nominated memoir, All the Sad Songs, an autobiographical comic series, Paper, Pencil, Life. Um, she had this great piece on Sylvia Plath and The New Yorker that got sent around a lot and which won the Slate Studio Prize. And I want to mention she has a new memoir coming out from Fanographics, a family memoir called The Loadout, which is actually about her mother. So yes. talk, talk about some of the, you did a lot of early stuff for us, and this is your birth story, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, um, my child was born in a, in a taxi in Brooklyn. Yes, it was very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I did that for her birthday, and I should say right away that my daughter is trans, and so in these early, early comics, she, she goes by her dead name of Gus, and I actually have permission to share these. Um, but yeah, so uh, I actually started making comics uh, just as a way to um, uh, get down what I was living every day. And so they're very raw. I just use the pen, no ruler. And um, because my kid was really high energy and I was living in a small town for the first time we moved from Brooklyn to the Hudson Valley. And I suddenly went from 50-50 childcare with my partner to all me all the time, and um, I really needed to figure something out. So all of these comics that I published with Mother was, I think Mother was the first place to publish me. Um, I got you guys, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> yes, and, um, and honestly, now I look back on that, and it was such a doorway to the community of comics because I met Glynis, who's, I mean, I will say this, she's one of my best friends, and uh, don't make me cry. Um, <laughs> And I did, I, I sought her out because I saw her work and I was like, hey, I'm published at Mother too. And um, it's just been, yeah, it was a real gateway to the comics for me as publishing there. We talk a little bit in this, the description of this panel is also like blood and guts. And this comic is about something horrific, really. <laughs> right, like a yeah. birth that can, is a, is a. It's so dramatic. It's dramatic yes. and it's got a lot of bodily fluids. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. And um, one thing I was, I don't think I was able to cover this. Yeah, the, the taxi driver was nuts. Um, Didn't want you giving birth in this case. No, she did not want to <laughs> give, she... have us give birth in the taxi, and she actually tried to throw my husband out at the, on the B, BQE. Um, and I was like, get the fuck back 
in the car. I was just like, oh, we're going. I was just like, oh, my God. We just keep going to the birthing center, you know. Um, and my husband's like, oh, okay, I'm getting back in the car. Um, so, but it was. It was really traumatic, but also just like, wow, what a story. And honestly, it's so perfect to her. So that is 100% her personality. And, uh, I mean, I should have just been like, oh, we're so screwed. Um, so, yeah. I, so it was good to get that down, definitely. But I did that in an hour. You know, it was one of those things I was able to do um, over a couple sittings, and it just feels so good to have it, you know, in comic form. It's fascinating to hear you talk about your work as being loose and fast, because you actually have such a dense style. Oh, really? That's nice. I meant that. There's a lot of detail, like a lot of uh, storytelling carried in the background mm. details. This is just a piece here that very typical to a lot of what we publish about how kids are weird. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, making this mask that was like too long and really creepy, and um, and I just love how the the um, the person who checked us in the grocery store just like didn't care. It was like this <laughs> terrifying, you know, cardboard mask was going looking straight at him. You know, it's just you're not gonna nothing, boy. It's okay. Um, and this one actually is a really important comic to me because. It is the very first one where I was like, I'm not going to do it in a diary form. I'm actually going to try to make an essay. So it was the very, very first time I was like, I'm going to do something about a subject, and uh, which was about sort of Poppy's um, developmental issues. And it was actually not long after this that I stopped making comics about her entirely. Um, mm -hmm. But I really, yeah, that's a doorway to a lot of my work. I feel like that comic is. When we get into general questions, let's definitely pick up this discussion of privacy. Yeah. Because over 10 years, I will say, I'll just reiterate this when we get back to it, we've had the experience of having trying to conceive birth comics and kids grow up mm -hmm. while their parents are writing about them and then things change in yeah. terms of their relationship to the work. Yeah, I mean, shortly after this, I mean, I can speak honestly because now it's, it's a public subject in my family, but you know, Poppy was diagnosed with um, autism and I went to make a comic about it and I suddenly realized this isn't my story. Um, and I was not diagnosed with a, an autistic child. <laughs> you know, this is really, and I suddenly really got what these comics, you know, I think that this is the dance that I think you make as an autobiographical artist. You know, who are you speaking for? And uh, my child, I just really feel like she has it's important that she has her own experience and her own memories um, and that I don't use that um, as my material because it's really not mine. My parents, on the other hand, free for all. But, uh, <laughs> and she's also entitled to my story. Honestly, she is. Um, but I am not entitled to hers. She didn't ask to be part of this. I brought her into it. So. Yeah, we'll pick that up more later because every artist does negotiate that differently. And I will say that I'm I'm in conversation with people about it, but I definitely don't tell people not necessarily to write about their kids either. We absolutely, we are excited about writing about parenting. So, you know, your story is, is you at, yeah. in that experience absolutely. too. So I don't want to silence women and mothers and other t kinds of parents either with that. I think that can be a backlash inherent in that. I think the, the environment, I, I know we should put a pin in this, but no, just it's okay. briefly I want to say like that, the online environment for talking about one's kids has been so poisoned by mm. uh, the commodification of kids mm -hmm. and that that culture that is so dominant uh, and as an antidote, mother really provides a, a completely different forum for that. But but it's hard. And apparently, the first generation of kids whose uh, children of mommy bloggers are now adults, and they're really mad. Yes, <laughs> right. that's real. Just yeah, it's really yeah. 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 Could talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, let's come back on it because <laughs> I want to give Wit a chance to be introduced since I sorry Wit second yeah. time. No, it's okay. <laughs> Please, this is I. This is like professional development for me to talk about this too. Like this issue obviously comes up over and over again with my role as an editor. Um, so Wit Taylor's a cartoonist, writer, educator from New Jersey. Um, her books include Montana Diary, Ghost Stories, and Harriet Tubman Towards Freedom. She has a truly impressive list that I will not go through, but you should definitely check out her site of anthologies and editing projects, mini comics and series, including Fizzle, which is an Ignatz nominee this year. So everybody check it out. Um, she's a frequent contributor and a longtime uh, contributing editor at The Nib. And she's been an Ignatz nominee and winner and a Glyph Awards nominee. So with, this is a piece that you did for Mother, right after the 2016 election of Donald Trump. Yeah. And you did not have kids yet. And I don't know, 
I, I will say that you and I have had a, had had a conversation about you thinking about having kids before yes, this, I and that, that meant a lot to me that we were talking about it. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with actually cartoonists and writers and people in publishing who will say like, "What has this been like?" But it was still a while before that. So you wrote about your mother yes. and your family. Yes, well, I feel like my mom and my grandmother and come up a lot in my comics because they're just such a a big part of my life, um, and yeah, this was the weekend after uh, the election, 20, what, 2016, wow. Um, and just like talking to my mother about just feeling this sense of despair and dread over what was to come, and my mom grew up in New Orleans in the 50s, like under legal segregation, and she was just like, you have to put some of this into perspective too. Um, she, she wasn't as panicked as I was, and. And she was just like, you know, um, she's like, I actually feel like there will be justice one day. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like you just have to go the course, you have to fight, you have to be engaged. And I felt like her, that was kind of grounding for me just to have like somebody with this lived experience uh, saying that. Um, and so that was kind of like what this was about, just reflecting on my mother and her history and how that has affected me. Um, and I'm in definitely a different place now after having like two kids and stuff like that. Um, a lot of my work now is, about that, um, I had a baby in April 2020, and during the beginning of the pandemic, like wasn't even sure if my husband was going to be allowed in the hospital in New Jersey during the peak. It was it was really awful, um, and I, I think that um, then I had another one two years later, <laughs> um, and so a lot of my work has been about like parenting and isolation, like trying to find a community, especially in those early months and years where you're just looking for connection. And like when that happened during the pandemic, there was like no way to connect with other parents truly except for online. And so I feel like a lot of us now are doing catch up and we're like not sure really how to mm. operate with kids because we were so separated during those early months and years. Um, so I think a lot of my work addresses that right now. Um, and, and Mother Magazine has just been like such an inspiration to me. Like everybody sitting at this table, I've been reading their comics and it, it made me feel like there was like a, a path forward as a mom and a cartoonist. Um, so yeah, I just wanna thank you all cause it's been really like foundational for me. So these comics didn't appear in Mother and I wanted to especially include them to talk about the ways that actually as a non-commercial magazine, and I wanna make that explicit, we don't, we're an all volunteer effort. We have no advertising. It's just existed as like a real kitchen table indie literary magazine for these 10 years. I am delighted when people publish with bigger and bigger places that are paying and are larger platforms. And you have also had New Yorker cartoons, right? Is that true? Yeah, I've done a few New Yorker. This is for like Instagram. I do like just random Instagram comics about it sometimes. This is a good blood and guts. <laughs> I was just like, I have nothing to hide at this point. It, it is what it is. Um, I love this one. Oh yeah, that's when we all got COVID, uh, my three month old. and. My toddler and how old is the baby just now? He's eleven months. Eleven months. You are in it. First time away from my kids. So. Oh, <laughs> this is the f when I when mine was two was the first time I had been away overnight. My older one. Yes. Um, this is very funny. I no. love this one so. I love this one so much. Toddler's favorite word. <laughs> like, I feel like it's tattooed on my skin. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Wait, do you want to talk a little bit about in that relationship to, you have, I think, the youngest kid on this panel. Um, any concerns you had about having kids and being and continuing as an artist and if uh, the magazine and other communities have helped you in that? Right, I mean, yeah, I wasn't sure, like, it was, like how it was gonna be. Um, right. Not only that, but just also being a person who's like a sensitive person, like somebody who's struggled with like depression and anxiety. Like I didn't know how I would be able to fare as a parent. Um, and it, you know, I've kind of shared all of that stuff, like the journey of getting pregnant, and like I did a comic on Instagram too about like, for instance, taking medic like antidepressants when you're pregnant, and like the stigma around that. So I like to address things like that, where like you know, the sticky topics that sometimes people don't want to talk about. Um, uh, what was, I'm trying to remember the train that I was going. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't, can you ask again? <laughs> oh, uh, you know, if, um, if there were communities you found, you know, um, beyond yeah. Mother, but also this that helped you in that transition. Right, so yeah, Mother, um, I would just say like, cartoonists in general who have kids. I feel like mm. we've been very, I've connected with a lot of people online and we're very like supportive of each other. Um, 
even just like connecting over shared comics and things like that. Um, and then family, honestly, has been a support um, and like my neighborhood and my community. But um, cartoonists and cartoonists' moms in particular have played a huge role in that for me. I make a lot of jokes about the publishing mom mafia. Okay. <laughs> Next, this is Pam Y, and I'm so delighted. This is the first time I've met Pam in person, though we've been working together for many years now, which is it's really an it's really lovely to get to see your face for the first time. Um, so, Pam is a cartoonist, but she was a fine artist also, and she's had her work shown across galleries in New York City. She's an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts. She's also studied at the Center for Cartoon Studies and the graphic novel. Uh, intensive program at Sequential Artists Workshop. Interestingly, two you know, folks who are associated with those are at the same table with her today. Um, she's an arts educator in New Jersey, and she's working on a graphic memoir, which we've been serializing now for how many years? Um, seven. For seven, seven years. years. Mm. Um, and then we're going to show you some pages from that. She also has a book about the history of Newark's St. Benedict's Prep School, which is available at Spiral Brown. Mm. So the series is called um, Water... <clears throat> Water I've Loved. Water I've Loved. I always insert that, and then Pam writes me and is like, that's not in the <laughs> <laughs> And this is actually, a, it's about her mother. Do you want to just dive in? Speak yeah, I, I sort of came at it a little differently than everybody. I, when I was unbecoming a mother, when my children were going away, I was anticipating my mm -hmm. boys, the twins, going away to college, and we were at the pool. And so water and loss, I did a piece, a three-page piece on that. And somehow I very quickly realized there, was, there were a lot of bodies of water that I loved, and they all nurtured me, and they all uh, were my objects of love because my mother was bipolar. I grew up with a bipolar mother. So um, when they went away, when I was anticipating they were going away, I did my first chapter, and then I realized I had a book that I, I needed to do. And so it's, half of it is about my childhood memories, and the second half is adult memories. I'm kind of splitting them up. They got kind of mixed up, and I'm keeping a strict chronology now. Um, because my mother gaslit us all, that she was, nothing was wrong, everything was perfect, and um, she certainly had, did not have bipolar disorder. So um, my adult memories validate my childhood experiences of, wait a minute, what's going on? And, uh, because I could see it and I could remember clearly and I knew about the disorder. So, but also the times changed. Nobody would have ever dreamed of talking about being insane uh, when I was a little girl. So a lot of it, this is about Cape Cod. Uh, that's kind of the motherlode beach um, that we went to as a child. And, you know, little things would strike me about my mother that were odd and anxiety provoking. She was institutionalized many times at Medfield State Hospital, uh, which is where Shutter Island was filmed. So it's a, a horrible place. <laughs> and um, for six months at a time uh, in extreme um, episodes, usually manic. But she was also hospitalized for depression, extreme depression, because she wouldn't eat or drink and she could die, so they had to hook her up. Uh, so there were periods of absence and loss. Um, that I also was very frightened of becoming my mother when I had children because the shit hit the fan. I was the youngest. I was not planned. Um, shit hit the fan when I was born, and she was hauled off uh, for her first six-month stint, although she was always bipolar, and you're more susceptible to postpartum mania and psychosis if you are bipolar. Um, so I... I waited until the 11th and a half hour um, to have my children with a lot of assisted reproductive medicine. Um, my boys are now 25. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, the issue of privacy. Um, they're, they're in my comics regularly and they're fine with it, but when I start getting into sensitive issues in the book, I am not sure how much I can reveal. And with my mother, we've had conversations. There are certain things I really wrestled with, and I said, I can't reveal that about my mother. I can talk around it and you know, create a different kind of a story, but there are certain little sores that I need to respect um, and keep private. So same with my boys. I'm not sure you know, what's gonna happen when I get into the further, the later, a uh, couple of the later chapters that I'm circling around now. 
Um, but this is, this is a memory, this is a, so the first two or three were from my childhood. Uh, this is from my adulthood. When my father died, my mother was on the couch in her underwear and wouldn't get dressed. And people were coming over, it was the wake, the funeral, and um, she was very mad at me. Um, she was psychotic, drunk, because of course drinking starts happening when you're um, manic. And she came at me with a frying pan. I was not aware that she was behind me with the cast iron frying pan. But I saw my husband's arms, so thank <laughs> he got her arm away from my head. I mean, she was going to, you know, to kill me. <laughs> so, um, I love this page. I've always loved this page as an editor because of the detail with the frying pan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, especially because, and we're touching on this in a way and talking about the privacy issues, memory is fallible. Memory is, you know, a slippery thing. And that is true about memoir, but there's something very real about the cast iron. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, so, it's so beautifully rendered. I, I agree. I really feel it. Like, it, it's this domestic object that I think a lot of us engage with physically every day, mm -hmm. you know? Well, she was a great cook, but she, <laughs> so it was fitting that she would want to kill me with that. God damn. <laughs> this um, is a, a page about grief, and yeah. also in color. I wanted to bring some of Pam's color work in. Yeah, she, um, I did a postscript, although the book isn't done yet, um, about my mother dying. And amazingly, I mean, she's extremely important to me, and her loss was really, really rough. It was rough. Some people have suggested, a therapist, psychoanalyst suggested, you're mourning the mother you never had. Mm. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I had that mother, and that's who made me who I am, and I'm mourning her. She's the mother I had. I mean, I, there's no other mother I would want. You know, I gotta say, as the, my mother's a therapist, therapists say a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my yeah, god, the whole job, yes. I just have a quick slide here. I had to give a shout out when I started this. Uh, yeah. when, I, when I had kids, I had been the kind of person who read a lot about motherhood before I had kids. And in my college years, actually, I started reading um, Catherine Arlotti's work, and I also started reading Hit Mama. And when I was in college, the East Village Inky. And I love that these That is folks. literally the mother load. I just feel like this so good. amazing. I, I love this work. And uh, actually, people have sometimes referred to Mother Magazine as like the first doing this. That's not true. Hit Mama was definitely doing it. And I really want to point to Ariel Gore's work. Hit Mama was great. So also, can we have that cookie recipe? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. That's, uh, well, you have to write Anne. Um, oh, no, sorry. That's from Ariel's work. And Anne's been in the magazine. Catherine Aldi definitely. Anyways. There, there's, and I also, we just did a 10 years retrospective at Fanographics Gallery. I don't know if there's anyone else in the audience who's been a contributor. There's so many folks at SPX, we could have filled this whole room. And I really want to thank everyone who's been a contributor. We have some new work actually up uh, just past week from Jonna um, Mandel. I don't know if she's here today, yeah, but. she's here. She's right there. <laughs> she's Wave your hand. Yay. It's a really fabulous piece. Please log on and check it out. And then we have an event in New York uh, later this month. I just want to you know, shout out there. So I'm going to leave that up so you can write it down. <laughs> and then I want to talk about this question of what we keep secret and what we tell and why and how that's changed. Because that obviously is what is pressing for the folks on this panel. And I think it's notable that a lot of you have been early at the magazine, so your kids have grown up and you're looking back at work you did that's different. Um, Whit, do you want to jump in? Because you know, you, you're at this earlier stage thinking about how you're addressing, you're, you're writing about your kids, writing about yourself. Right, I don't, I don't think I'm quite at the place yet where they're, <laughs> they're conscious that I'm writing about them and want me to stop. <laughs> but I am aware that that will likely, I'll get to that point at, at some point. Um, and I do think a lot about like the details, like I include them, like will he, Will he want this to see, like his friends, to see something about a, a diaper situation or whatever, like, you know, years down the line? Um, so I try, to, I try to be thoughtful about it. I mean, it's, it's something I've been dealing with though as an autobio cartoonist for years, though, just in different ways, you know, with like other family things or friends or like, you know, relationships, things like that. Um, so it is on my mind. Um, but one thing that has been nice with this autobio is I feel like it's allowed me to portray myself more realistically of just being kind of like feeling like a mess all the time and like feeling like I'm just trying to like manage all of these like constantly moving pieces. Um, so it's been kind of freeing 
in effect, in like becoming a mother and like being able to just be like, you know what, like, fuck it, I'm just gonna like lay it all out because this is like what's really happening. So it, it's been kind of nice. Yep, dive in. I um, wanna... Well, I wanted to say I mostly work with fiction. And so when I'm telling stories about m mothers and children, I, I tend to fictionalize things. And that is my way of not uh, telling stories about people that they might not want out there uh, and, and turning them a little bit. But I will say, for me, there's been some cultural um, pushback from my family. Not so much don't share our stories, but literally don't air the dirty laundry in front of the goyim, which mm -hmm. is something that Ashkenazi Jews say to each other mm -hmm. in private. But my mother actually said it to me when I was working on Unterzaken, which was a fictional book I put out a decade ago. Mm. Um, I think, though, that, that fictionalizing things is a real joy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can really play in that area and not have to worry. Mm -hmm. But I did, I started out making autobiographical comics when I was making minis in, in art school. And I remember at the time feeling like, I have to say everything and tell everybody every single detail of what happened and my opinion about it. <laughs> Yeah, we've had a cultural <laughs> shift in comics. There's definitely like a 90s era raw work, which we do still very much. Like we yes. have that vibe at Mother Magazine, where telling every detail is part of a re rebellious act against sanitizing yeah. people's well huma said. human experience and women and non-binary and trans folks' experiences that I do as an editor and want to keep having conversations with everyone on this panel about, want to maintain while also understanding privacy issues with young children. And so I do want to give to each artist the ability to navigate that, including, dare I say, taking their work down. We've had work taken down, so if you guys want to take your work down. <laughs> like at the request of people's children? Yeah, yeah, people have asked. I've actually had children write me directly, oh, oh my and gosh, then we've wow. taken it down. Um, not necessarily comics, but that's there's a lot of stories there that are interesting, and they're all individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a stepmother's work, who then was no longer the stepmother, for example. Mm -hmm. I took that down directly. Oh, interesting. Um, I just I, I wanted to say something like what's what drew me to making comics about my own you know motherhood is that it's you know for such a universal experience, it's so lonely, mm -hmm. um, and I there are so many people who have made work that I have just felt it made me feel less crazy, mm -hmm. less alone. And um, I always try, you know, I th I, I'm inspired by that so much. It's just that connectivity. And it's strange, you know, it's funny, you know, it's been 10 years, hello, um, <laughs> since, uh, and I feel like there's people who are 10 years younger than me, like Wit, having kids. But I've seen comments on other people's um, comics, because there's, there's still mothering comics being made. And I've seen younger people being like, no one's ever talked about this. Thank you so much. And I was just like, actually, it's been going on <laughs> and, uh, for a long time. And also Grace Paley and you know, Anne Aileen Lamont. Kaminsky and Crumb. Aileen Kaminsky. Like, there's, there's a long tradition. It's just that you just don't know until it happens to you how much you need these things. Um, and so it's like, you know, it's a uh, renewable source of information every 10 years. Yeah. And it is a website. Like that's, you can, I know the internet is forever, but actually you can put something up and it's not printed and experiment with it and then decide we can take it down again. And we're open to that, which again does tie to being non-commercial, mm -hmm. I think, and that I don't have an advertiser on that page where suddenly you lose that revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on this? I know it's such a big topic. Yeah, for, uh, for me, I had to wait until my mother was no longer alive. There's right. no way yeah. ever <laughs> that I could have written this uh, or continued to write it or delve into these issues. Well, one, because we were still juggling with the, the, the insanity, which was a, you know, kind of a, a full-time job and it was never ending and kept the focus on her. So there was really wasn't time to reflect and um, she would may not have been aware of it if I did it while she was alive, but I didn't have the wherewithal um, to do it while she was alive. How are we doing on time? Do we have until 120? 120? 125. 125, okay. So I'm gonna leave the last seven-ish minutes, but I wanna actually talk about the elephant in the room, which is doing this work logistically with children. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and also with the trying to conceive, which I think is this sometimes kept secret experience that can be very logistically complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so do you all wanna talk about like how you made time this week? And like this is a, people complain about being asked this, but I also think it should be out there. Well, can I Please. jump in yeah. with something? I think the first thing we should all, I think like the baseline for this discussion is we live in a country that loathes 
mothers, it loathes parents, it loathes most people. It, and also, it's a country that does not value cultural production. So we're, we're just pushing against a lot of forces when we're working. I also want to say there's residencies for people with kids, and mm -hmm. it, you should know about them. There, there are more of them all the time. In fact, we're doing this event with Pen Parentis that, uh, in, in September, so if you want to come, they have a, a grant. For, as well as the Sustainable Arts Grant is an example. This whole yeah. list, we should really put a page up, actually. I'll think about that. Yeah, there's, and there's a few, I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but I'll get with you later yeah, about residencies <laughs> for, for people with kids. Oh, yeah. Um, somehow there, there should be a collected, uh, unless maybe there is, um, opportunities, especially for parents. I mean, I know the Sustainable Arts Foundation it's they are so generous but there is there the the number of applications for that mm -hmm. versus the grants is just un un um, imaginable i mean and i think it's just risen like crazy we have two winners here yeah oh yeah but but i mean it's it's also i've also been a judge for that mm -hmm. and the amount of applications is astounding um so there there is such a need and i i think that I felt that really personally where, um, you know, like you pay a babysitter and you make work and it goes nowhere. Like the balance between like, um, it doesn't go nowhere. The balance between paying for time to work and the value of that work is so unrecognized. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna draw a comic and this is worth the $30 I just paid that babysitter. Right. It's not It's not an equation at all. And so I think my comics here were so short because of the amount of time I had. I mean, I could do uh, a page while they were uh, in preschool and then mm -hmm. time's up. <laughs> You're <laughs> not, no more for that day. Um, and it's like clawing time out of something, and a, and and not just time, but like the focus that's beyond just what just spilled on the floor, or who's who's why is that? Why are they crying? And you know, it's it's the fractured brain that that is so hard to uh, do anything around. For me, well, anyway, it was. I would say um, one one thing I. I would offer as unsolicited advice is don't clean your house. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it. Oh, yeah. I mean totally. it. Totally. Yeah. Like, like yeah. unless unless you need to do it once in a while to clear your head or you, yeah. you're done with a project. Yeah. But yeah. I have a friend who doesn't have kids but gets very she's a studio artist and makes beautiful work. And her husband has a phrase when she starts cleaning the house. He says, "Stop counter wiping. Mm. <laughs> like, go to your studio." Nice. So now I think of that all the time. Yeah. Counter wiping. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite, sorry, one of my favorite quotes um, by Anne Lamott is like, before I had a child, I couldn't do any work until all the dishes were done. And now that I have a child, I could have a corpse in the sink and it would be fine. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, my son came home and visited us. Uh, he's working, was working in New Jersey, so he stayed with us for a week. And he took the vacuum out <laughs> and he said... He, st he said, the dust in here is ridiculous. And I said, honey, you've lived with this dust your entire life. You should be immune. He said, no, I got allergies now. I said, how'd that happen? You know, and he's, he's vacuuming, which inspired me to then clean for the whole weekend. Because, yeah, that went out the window Kids long crying. time ago. Yeah, again. yeah exactly. Yeah, wait, wait, jump in. No, it's just like, I'm like, I don't know what I did with all my time before I had kids. Mm. Like, now it's just like... I mean, I've had to switch out, switch up how I draw a lot. Like I'm mostly doing it, like on Procreate on my iPad in between, like when I have time to do it. But it's like, it's hard to use nap times, for instance, to draw when you really just want to be like resting or like after they go to bed and then like trying to squeeze it in then. And I just feel like I'm like always falling short, but also like making comics just feels like a drive. So like I have to do it, otherwise I'm gonna be like really antsy. It, it's like it's tricky, and it's it's like I work when I can, but like. We don't like make enough to justify me like you know um, doing comics full time. It's just not. It's just yeah. a, a financial reality. So I really have to like kind of be flexible, and work. And my my three and a half year old just started preschool, so I'm like that's great. But now I have an 11 month old now, and so between that and also the pandemic and being like, well, I kind of want to keep them home and like protect them as much as I can. I've just had to like pause so many things and just kind of. 
like lower my expectations for myself, which is very hard, but it's like cr it's crucial right now. Yeah. But in a sense, I've I've liked how it's made me become more efficient mm. as an artist. I'm like, what do they really need to know? What do I really want to share? Yeah. Can I just make this look really ugly? Like that's fine. Yeah. And sometimes I find that people respond to those ugly ones the best because it's like the most immediate and the the rawest. Yes. So, yeah. I think um, it gets a lot easier when they go to school. Also. It really does. <laughs> I I had to leave New York City in order to really become the artist that I wanted to be. Um, I. You know, with our first child, I was home with her for 14 months, unrelentingly, mm -hmm. in ap while the economy was completely collapsing, and I lost all of my work, and my partner lost half of his work, and we were just like struggling really hard. We couldn't afford to send her to preschool, mm -hmm. so you know everything changed when she went to preschool. Even like half days, mm -hmm. suddenly I had a, a job again, you know, making my work, but. I looked around and I, I realized I have my drafting table in the living room next to the couch. I'm a professional working artist and I've never had a studio. We gotta get out of here. Mm -hmm. So I do, sometimes you have to go someplace cheaper. <laughs> right, yeah. And, you, yeah, and both of you did amazing books in that. There's a lot of uh, ways I think that having kids creates a constraint that can be very creatively stimulating though. It helped like me I, a lot. You know, like it, it's true that there's a sort of sonnet-like constraint to time, mm -hmm. and uh, the ways that our memory shifts around with the like physical changes of birth or adoption also, I think, creates changes in the way we think um, that uh, create a sort of fluidity and surrealism in the work coming after. Also, stripping away, I think, I think when you have a kid, however you had ended up having that child, you know, adoption, birth, whatever, like certain things just fall away after that. Mm -hmm. Like, this is gonna sound really trivial, but it does matter. I hate shopping now mm -hmm. of any sort. Like, just, just, you know, I started wearing a uniform after I had kids, <laughs> yeah. so I didn't have to think about clothes anymore. Yeah. I wanna open up to questions. Does anyone have questions in the audience? Please. So we talked a lot about privacy of like what you do within your comics. Um, I'm someone who, my kid is not on any social media. Mm -hmm. like, most people don't even know their real name until they see me in real life again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very funny. Um, how do you balance kind of what is the line between things that you share in like real life, like on social media and stuff, like of their actual faces or actual things, versus what you can depict in a comic or in an autobiographical, uh, autobiography sense? Mm. And what, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll say that I stopped posting pictures of Poppy online at all because uh, we live in a very tiny town and it's just so, she's so accessible. Um, and I know a lot of people, I love seeing pictures of their kids. I love seeing them grow up. I am a huge fan of Wood Taylor's babies. I love them so much. Oh, they're so cute, oh, these I babies. I eat them up, oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, but so like stuff like that changed for me um, because your audience suddenly grows and people feel like they know you. Um, and so I just like, I've put up protective things about that. Um, but also, you know, being an autobiographical artist, I think the thing that I feel about my work is if I can't tell it, this story in a crowded room with that person there, then I can't tell it. That's mm. my, my marker. You're like the anti-Joe Matt. Oh my gosh. God bless Joe Matt. Yes, it's true. I feel so conflicted over it, honestly. Like, I, I post pictures of my kids, like, on Instagram sometimes. But, like, I'm getting to this point where I'm like, I might need to stop doing that and uh, make, you know, just share privately with people. Like, I try to do it, like, as as little as I can. It's, it's hard, though, especially when you feel so isolated. And you're like, this is what my life is. I'm just trying to communicate with people, like, you know, what's going on, what my, what my daily life is. But... It is getting to the point, yeah, where people will message you and they act like they know you, and you're just like, oh, I, I don't know. I just got to be like really thoughtful about it. So it's tricky. Yeah. I think on Facebook, um, I, I kind of divide social media. Facebook is almost like a photo, family photo album for very close friends and family to share photos with, as opposed to Instagram, which I don't. I very rarely 
Uh, but my kids grew up, when they, when they were little, uh, social media was not what it is now. I was working on, ch I, my solution to having little kids was to try and make children's books with them as the main characters, because they're twins and they're redheaded, so they seemed like they'd be perfect characters. Uh, so it, it also, I could draw while they were outside playing, I'd do what they were doing, but I would post that, but not the pictures of them. I would do the artwork, because it could be anybody, really, once it becomes an artwork, for me, anyway, at that time. Glynisa, do you want to say anything? Uh, you know, I drew a lot of these comics without thinking about them, seeing them actually, you know, like, they were little kids, they're not on social right. media, and I, w I wasn't, they were going to Mother Magazine, my kids weren't going to look up Mother Magazine, mm -hmm. but if I, you know, from there, via Facebook, to, you know, the neighbors, to, you know, the kids in their class, parents who I was friends, so I did this um, without... Um, probably less awareness than I should have had. And the world has changed. I want to say that also. We're That's always really speaking true. from our contemporary experience. Um, just as an editorial perspective, you can make your kids like some little bunnies or something too. I know. You know? Like yes. that's the beauty of comics. Yes. Also, yeah. it's the beauty of all creative writing. You can write yeah. them as bunnies too, but you can really draw them as bunnies. Mm -hmm. um, a question on the end. Yes, please. There's clearly a very uh, expansive and critical mm. and radical understanding of what mother motherhood is, mm -hmm. and you've several times said, you know, uh, parents or mothers or trans and non-binary mm -hmm. people. But I, I am curious from, from all of you, um, or, uh, and, and also you as an editor, what that uh, inclusion does for gendering motherhood and parenthood. Mm. If that makes sense, mm. how? Um, each of you feels that 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 presence of, of other forms of parenting mm -hmm. is it additive? Does it decenter or does it help you um, in a, some kind of you know question in some feminist way? What mm -hmm. mothering is you know we had a statement about mother mothering being universal yet isolating. Uh, what if it's not exactly universal? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, what yeah. if, you know so to what extent does that mother versus mommy blog? Thing, um, change when we add other forms of parenting beyond the cis uh, hetero binary. Mm -hmm. Can I mention Tyler Cohen's work on the site is a yeah. great place to look. Um, we had to, so this great. panel is somewhat based on who's at SPX. I really wish Tyler could be here because they had a, a piece called Seminal Shift that they just published, which is about their child going through uh, gender transition and uh, or gender confirmation you know, experience and their own questions about their gender that came up through that experience. And it's a really fabulous piece. Um, some of our most sourced pieces have actually been um, text prose about the naming of parents. Um, so Andrea Lawler's work, uh, Andrea wrote um, Politics of the Form of a Mortal Girl, which is a huge sort of foundational uh, recent trans work, it's, it's prose. Andrea has a piece called Why Heart Doesn't Have Two Mommies about their experience <laughs> with their kids and naming themselves Baba. Um, it's really, there's just a lot there. Um, but let me take it to the panel. You know, how do you feel about the inclusivity of parenthood and it, how it interacts with your own identities? For me, to answer your question directly, it's additive um, mm. and instructive and really good to, to broaden the spectrum to include everyone. Um, it's, I think, uh, yeah, I, I guess at, at, the, at the risk of getting too into the weeds, I'll just say, say that. More of it, please. Yes. Um, I've all, I, it's interesting because I've all, I, I don't know how to do this. Um, the Heidi book, for me, the grandfather was like a great mother. Um, and, and then there was the goat, and, 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 and there would be milk coming from the goat that the grandfather was, with his gnarly, you know, brute hands was milking. And that notion of a, femin a feminine man um, has always been very attractive to me. Um, I think the men in my life 
maybe even my father, although he was kind of brutish, um, had that. So the mother, and also my mother was absent, so at certain times, so my father stepped in. Um, so I think that binary um, seems less clearly defined to me, and I didn't arrive at it with any political motivation, but more maybe learned as a child. And uh, for me, the Heidi book with the grandfather was the mother because the mother, was, in a lot of those books, the mother is gone. She disappeared, died, tragic. And the grandfather uh, was a great mother. Um, I yeah, want to pick up, I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry. go ahead. I just want to pick up on something Pam said. Um, for me personally, the terms masculine and feminine don't really mean anything. And they're sort of, to me, they're like, I know they're meaningful to other people, but I've never been able to anchor them in any way. So the idea that the mothering or parenting is, is gendered in any way was always weird to me growing up, and it doesn't make any sense. It looks like very, um, very external and superficial interpretations of human behavior. I mean, this site is really, the mission is to explode those binaries, to be very, it's not additive, it is what it is. You know, and open and embracing, and it's been very instructive. Is a great word uh, as well for us as editors, and um, I'd be glad to talk about it more. We have gotten the time, but I want to just encourage everyone. If anyone's at a table, can you shout out? Like we got the time to go, but what do you? Where are you guys at the exhibit hall to be chatted with more by these uh, audience members? Mm -hmm. About what? Oh, oh, where, oh, are you, yeah. where are you located, SPX? Where um, can we find you? Oh, I'm not here, but I am carrying around <laughs> my forthcoming uh, chapter in Mother Magazine. She's holding off um, publishing it so I could debut it here. So if you see me and you'd like to trade or you know purchase for a nominal amount. Um, only because people value things more if they pay for them. Um, I, otherwise, I give them away for free. Um, but that's my latest chapter. It's not my most recent chapter that I created, but it's the most recent that's going to be published um, at Mother. It's the 11th uh, installment. I'm at I11B, and I do have a new um, mini about just a collection of some New Yorker parenting comics. Um, we are right next to each other on W62 and 3, which is right in, as you come in the doors, we're right there. Don't ignore us when right. you come in. <laughs> come in and turn around and look at look yeah. back. Yes. Um, I have a, sorry. Excuse me, Glennis. <laughs> um, I have uh, a new issue of Paper Pencil Life, uh, number eight, um, and Poppy is not in that. It's very beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am signing books at the Field Mouse table tomorrow from 3.15 to 4.15. Uh, that is table number M13, I believe. And I have a new book called You Are Not a Guest that collects all of my nonfiction comics that I've done since 2016. So that is actually autobiographical, somewhat. Thank you all so much for being a part of the magazine. It just, I cannot tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.